So we already did a little bit of discussing about the testing part of things. Um, we have, well, our goal is to go through most of these points here. And I think we can, right? Yeah, it's, well, the, the goal is to leave time for exercises. So, so that people can have uh, uh, time to yeah. do, do stuff with their own hands. Yeah. So I guess the overall map here is we have two things about concepts, which hopefully we can get done a little bit faster than these times here. Testing locally, which is how you can use things on your own computer, which is... Um, very like you know well it's just on your computer and that's what we've mostly done uh automated testing is doing this on gitlab or github and automatically when you push something there and then a bit of discussion about test design and things like that and the automated testing is exactly the section where we kind of like intertwine things exactly. that the, the the github and the and our tests are becoming more and more integrated with each yeah. other so so everything is coming together yes um actually looking at these timing should we spend more time on testing locally or test design um Yeah, because test design is uh, test design is basically isn't it personally exercises. I flip them. Yeah, but this is exercises. Yeah. Well, I think because yeah, uh, yeah cause the, okay, the test design section is uh, mostly exercises, mm -hmm. so it would be good to have okay as so, much as time as possible. Okay, there. so we'll focus on these two, yes. Okay, so let's first begin with motivation, which yeah. we've already talked about a little bit in the icebreaker, but for purposes of being complete and for anyone that arrived late, so what would we say here? So. Tamu, what goes wrong when someone doesn't have tested code? Yeah, the I think the official answer and the official official answer in the material is uh, that testing is helps with uh, re replicability, mm -hmm. and then uh, the other. What is actually the other? There is another point that is. Yeah. Uh, um, and correctness or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think correctness. Yeah. But then, what does it mean in in practice? Yeah. So I so, guess. Yeah. So like we learned yesterday, I started my career off my studies off in chemistry. And for that, there were very clear courses about analytical chemistry, which is about measuring things. And there you learn things like, okay, so how do you tell how some device works? Well, first you give it some known quantity, and then you see what it measures and is it correct? And I guess that's the basic idea here. So I write some code and if I, how do I know if it works? Well, yeah. I, so, so you take the expected expected value and and compare yeah. it to the output of the yeah. code. Yeah. And then, the first time I do this, I might run it myself from my terminal or editor, whatever. But testing is the perhaps relatively simple idea that instead of running this just once then make another program that can automatically run your code 
and compare it to the output. So you can do it all the time. Can you run tests too often or too much? I don't think so. I mean, if the tests take too long to run so that you never run them, that's not great. But then okay, so I would have this, yeah. There is this kind of like a practical limit. So yeah. if the test is takes too long, but yeah, otherwise I agree. Like you, if if the practical question of too long tests is not an issue, then you can't run the tests too yeah. often. So here's an example. Let's make it bigger. So this is fairly typical how I start off testing for some small code I do. So let's say I'm making some big code and there's some small function and I'd start the testing there. So test Fahrenheit to Celsius. So we're converting temperature. So Tamu, can you look at this and immediately tell if it's correct or not? Uh, yeah. Okay. Now the problem is that the, the share screen, uh, yeah. uh, can, can you have sent me the Twitch link because uh, then I know what you're looking at. Okay. Mm, one minute. Where am I? Okay. I send it from here. Uh, I sent it via our chat. Uh, our chat? Yeah, like uh, ski comp chat. Okay, so Julie. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, okay. we'll go on yeah. when I so there's a function which is converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. And like I look at this and it looks like it's correct, but I can't be completely sure. Like I can do some math in my head, but I'd like a better way. So here's a test function. So it runs the function I'm testing. It knows what the result should be. And this I can tell in my head. So um, 100 should definitely be about 30 something, 40 something Celsius. And then I do a compar comparison. So in Python, I'm using a cert and I'm seeing, so there's a good question here. Why is this not, um, why am I not seeing if they're equal, but why am I seeing if the absolute value of their difference is less than some threshold? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that it is because of these lots of decimals. Exactly. That. So floating point are not exact. So this is how we compare. And there's actually all kinds of other functions to help make things like this easy. But this is the basic idea. So yeah, so for any function I write, there should be some initial test case I use to see, is it right? And I make some test like this and then compare. Let's look at the other languages. So C++. Hmm, it looks a little bit longer, but I still see it's running some code. <laughs> yeah. R, well, they're all pretty similar. Yeah, so so the details of the code uh, differ, but the overall structure yeah. is similar in all languages. That you have the actual actual function, mm -hmm. and then you have the test function. Yeah. So so the test is also a function. It just calls the original function and takes gives it some input and takes its output and then. Uh, compares the output to the expected output. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So why else? Tests help preserve what you expect, which I think really is one of the big points. So it means that mm -hmm. when you write it once, 
you know that you won't accidentally break it someday. How many people have written some code and then you've realized that months later you've broken something and you don't know when? It um, doesn't feel good. <laughs> everybody of us. Yeah. So and and I I actually agree that this is this is the functionality that or the the purpose of testing that makes your life easier. Mm -hmm. And and from from like like I I would say that testing is you should to do testing for selfish reasons because <laughs> it does make your life easier. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, it, when you change your code, then you have more confidence that that everything, everything that used to work an hour ago or a month ago is still working mm -hmm. as you are expecting it to. Yeah. And without tests, if you make changes to your code or or you're adding new functionality to your code. Then without tests, there actually is not really any any uh, way to tell if your yeah. old code is still working. Yeah. And then your then how you don't have any confidence in your work. Yeah. So test helps user of the code. Like for example, if we're installing some code for someone else then um we can make sure that it works or someone else that's modifying it they can be more sure that whatever they're doing isn't breaking it so there's this funny picture here so how much armor and protection do you need before modifying someone else's code that you don't understand yeah yeah, so there's the collaboration aspect. Yeah. So, yeah, because definitely when you're when you're trying to contribute to somebody else's work, yeah. then it's <laughs> much nicer that you also have this confidence that yeah. you are not breaking things. Yeah. And the other way, if someone's contributing something back to me, if they if they send me some change and all the tests still pass, I have a lot more confidence in just accepting what they do if it looks good rather than spending a lot of time on it. So there's a question in the notes. Is it not always easy to make a short test? What would you suggest for that? Actually, we talk about test design at the end and we go to progressively harder and harder things. So this last one is sort of interesting. So if code is easy to test, then that might mean that it's going to be good code overall. So that is something important to keep in mind. So here's, for example, what we did before. So this function is, well, it's designed pretty well. It takes an argument and it returns something. But here's a code that uses these global values. It gives an argument. It does some stuff, but it doesn't return anything. It just sets it as the global, and that's harder to test. So this sort of goes with this question number seven in the note. So once you start testing things, it encourages you to design things that's easy to test, and then that helps you later on. Uh, when would you not add tests or when is too much? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a compromise because writing tests is, um, at, at least in the beginning, it, it takes time to get routine to it. Yeah. So, so you can like become lazy and and not mm -hmm. add tests but there are like of course some some cases where it makes sense to not and i think this mm, 
what do you think about the first first point that if you plot something mm -hmm. and then you can uh and then you can like examine the plot yeah uh i mean in that case do you do you agree with that case or i mean in that case i'd probably try to make a test so the plot i wouldn't test directly but i would have the code split so that i can test the raw data without looking at the plot because the plot will be seen anyway like that might be a good balance for me yeah i mean in some ways it depends like if i would always notice a problem when running it it doesn't matter but usually when a code gets so big that there could be a non-obvious problem then it's useful yeah it's uh i i kind of like i i understand the sentiment behind the kind of the question that because the plot is something you see so you can visually like mm -hmm. examine it but then yeah. but then i would also do that it, that for example if you have thousands of data points and they are all scattered mm -hmm. you have a scatter scatter plot then yeah. it uh i would definitely add tests to before you plot mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. for the for the values in the yeah. x-axis and the values in the y-axis that they are yeah. actually making sense yeah there's some good questions in the notes test our code how do you ensure the tests aren't buggy themselves <laughs> i know <laughs> so my favorite answer here is to say i hope that they aren't both bugged or that if one test is buggy, there's other tests that do similar things that will find the problem and I do it. But I have uh, been, yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a point there on, but also one question and I'm gonna ask the question for you. That, mm -hmm. Do you write tests for the tests? I usually wouldn't. Yeah, but I mean, no. then again, my stuff is not so important that it needs it. But but could you I mean, write tests for the tests? I mean, I would prefer to write two tests to test the same code differently, and mm -hmm. then hope that if one of the tests is wrong, the other test will find the problem, and then I'll find the problem in the first test. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I have never seen anyone writing tests yeah. for tests but it's a it's a yeah. nice question to kind of ponder yeah there's another question what happens when you inherit a code that doesn't have any testing or documentation and you need to work on it and improve it uh yeah Good <laughs> you know question. what i would say here cry well. <laughs> i mean <laughs> You know, I guess there you'd either take a risk and do what you can and realize you're probably miserable or be miserable a different way and try to add the test and get ahead of the situation and then um, and then you're a bit safer. I guess you could oh. say the point of this course is that we want to prevent this from happening in the future. Mm. Hey, one point about the the um, what if the test is wrong? Because the mm -hmm. test can be wrong in many ways. Mm -hmm. And then one one way is uh, that the that maybe the expected output is also kind of wrong. Mm -hmm. But but uh, here is uh, I think a very important kind of notion that the you can look the tests as that they are tracking if somebody ha something has changed mm -hmm, in the code. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so you yeah. you don't have to think that your test cases are correct. For example, because we're doing science, yeah. we often don't know what is the correct answer of a pipeline. Yeah. For mm -hmm, example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we are we so we start with some expected output and then yeah. we test it. And and then 
we can track if something has changed in yeah. the code because the test fails. Yeah. So I think that's a that's a very very good observation and good to keep in mind. Yeah. At least it helped me at some mm -hmm. point when I was pondering that. Yeah. Let's come back to this in the test design part, but I think we might be getting a bit behind time. So let's oh, okay. continue. Yeah. So if we go back to the main one, we will now go to concepts. But have we already covered most of the concepts? I think so. So we've got this great picture of someone shoving in every letter to the wrong place. Well, no, there's A and Z. And they are duplicates. And... <laughs> OK, so how do we test? Um, I think we've already covered a lot of this. So let's go quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's better if we can test frequently. So like an old style of things used to be people would do a bunch of code and every night test would run. And in the morning, you would have a message saying, did anyone break things yesterday? But that meant that you'd have to go figure out which thing broke things. So for that, testing it more automatically for every commit frequently and making it fast is really important. The most basic form of test is sort of defensive programming. So sort of checking your input arguments or output arguments to make sure that there's not something that's completely off-putting here. So now there's different definitions of different types of tests, which personally as a scientist, these definitions don't really matter much to me. We'll talk more in test design, but in general, people would say unit test, test one function. So these are really easy to write because it's, well, usually such a small thing. Integration test, test a whole wide range of different, like different functions working together, not just one. That so, would be, for example, if you have a data pipeline yeah. that start, starts with an raw data input and then it processes, processes, processes and outputs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Regression tests. So there were some questions before, like, what do you do if you don't know what the output is? Well, you can run the code once, see what the output is, like if it's some statistical model with a given seed or something. And then you can save that output and compare in the future. Is it giving the same thing it gave in the past within some tolerance or something? And that might help for some of these cases. Test-driven development is a cool idea. So that's basically where you know you need to make a function. First you make a test and then you make the function and you make it just until it passes the test. So it basically um, makes means that you're really defining the output before the input. And that's something that's a bit intense and extreme, but I think when it works, it's really cool. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a good kind of, like you said, like a nice idea or a concept to be yeah. aware of that this is one way to do things. Yeah. Continuous integration is our one of our exercises. So basically, it is where GitHub or GitLab or whatever service you have will test every single commit you push and will warn you immediately if something goes wrong. Let's resume talking about that later when we get there. So Co automated testing and continuous integration are roughly the... Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah mean the same thing here. Yeah. So code coverage is there's a type of test, I guess it's not exactly a test, but some other statistics which will tell you how, like what percentage of your code was actually run in the tests. And can even tell you line by line to say, okay, like this function was not tested, not run anywhere in your test. Let's look at 
does this even still work? Mm. What am I looking at here? So this is a service called coveralls.io and it shows for each file in this project which lines were run. So it says run, 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 not run, in red, and so on. So if you're developing tests, this can be a nice way of seeing what's covered or not. But let's not dwell on this too much. It's not okay. our main point now. Yeah, coverage is something that comes up very often. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, and I think the main thing there is it's a one number mm -hmm. because it's from zero to 100. Mm -hmm. So, and when you have one number, then that's nice because then you can yeah. see the number go up when you add tests. Yeah. Have you ever used coverage? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's I, because it's so simple to add to the mm -hmm. continuous integration. Yeah. And and it it's one number, so it's yeah. nice to see. Yeah. I mean, I must say that I've never added it on one of my projects. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Would you mind if somebody added it to your project? No, it would be good. It might motivate yeah. me to do it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Because like I, I might ignore the number, but it would be <laughs> nice to have the number. Yeah. Okay. This we've already mentioned about how. Okay, we're we are not we are not giving good practices here. <laughs> yeah. But I think part of what we should talk about is not just saying what you have to do to be best, but you know to realize that doing a little bit is okay. Yes. Yeah. Like, exactly. Don't let the perfect get in the way of the better. And the good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we already mentioned how if tests take too long to run, then they'll never be run and they don't really do much. Tests don't guarantee correctness. This is an example. Are this is a case where both the test and the other thing are wrong? Temk. This relates to the that you can. Sometimes you never know yeah. if your if your test is correct, but but you can track the change. Yeah. And usually you wouldn't be making tests too much yourself, but there's frameworks that make this really easy, which we will see in the next section. I think we've already covered all of these best practices. Um yeah. I like this, don't deactivate test temporarily. So I've changed mm -hmm. something, now my test doesn't work well, but what I did is good enough for now, so I'll comment out the test. There's some funny joke book, like uh, O'Reilly spoof, like commenting out failing tests for dummies or something like that. Anyway. Um, yeah, because the, the most probable outcome is yeah. that the temporarily deactivated test is is yeah. not gonna be activated yeah anytime soon so should we go on yes yeah okay so next up is testing locally mm -hmm. so what's the point of this lesson Well, to me, this is, uh, so testing locally is when you are, when you are developing, mm -hmm. you are developing locally. So you also want to, and, and you are writing tests. So you want to run the tests while you are writing them mm -hmm. and without all the time, like pushing to, for example, GitHub mm -hmm. to wait mm -hmm. for the automated testing to run them. Yeah. I think this is what it's. Yeah. And this could be an exercise, but the plan was to do it as a demo and focus on the more advanced exercises. Is that correct? Yeah. That's, what do you think? What is yeah. What does the timetable say? Should we? Yeah, I think we can 
Hmm. Well. We could do it as an exercise, I think. Yeah, of course. And uh, there. There'd it be less could. time for test design, but that's more philosophical, isn't it? Okay. Mm. So, so did we do this and it's an At exercise? Least. Let's do it as an exercise because yeah. then people get their hands dirty. Okay. Yeah. Quicker. So what is PyTest? Are you asking me or is that a well, so radical? You can answer if you want. It's a, a PyTest is a, it's a Python package. And it basically includes everything you'd need for testing. Mm -hmm. Of writing the tests. Yes. So it makes things really easy. Um, do we need to do any introduction to the exercise? Mm. Or should I show or should we get straight to it? I think the the instructions are in enough yeah. for self explanatory. Yeah. So in this you will make a new directory, you'll go there, you'll add in a file that has a function and a test. So in Python, adding any, adding strings together makes another string. So this sort of obviously looks like it works. So we can see two plus three should be five. And space and ship should be spaceship. And then PyTest is a command line tool. So you run it with the PyTest command, which should be installed in the code refinery environment. If you don't have the environment set up and activated, this won't work and I would recommend waiting until we get done. So we you run it and then it will show you the test is passed. And then you have to do something yourself. You break the test and you see that it fails. And then if you have more time, you can play with more. So it's really simple. Should we give 15 minutes for this? Yeah. And that sounds about right. That would be, it's 37 now, so. Um, come back at 52, a little bit of wrap up, then a break. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Let's go then. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Hello, we're back. And Ape. we'll basically go straight to a break now. So we're sorry for a bit changing the exercise plan. Um, there were some hiccups at the start. But the reason we wanted to do this is what we just did here right now with PyTest. It's what Temu and I and many people, it's the most common thing we do for testing. So making little test functions and using PyTest locally. That's where it all begins. And what we do next, we'll take this to GitHub. But with that, I guess let's go to a break until four minutes past the hour. See you soon. Bye. See ya. Hello, we're back. And now Thomas is here. So there were some issues earlier in the day, but um, now hopefully we can get a little bit more back on track. There's some questions about the previous uh, PyTest exercise, if we could reflect on that some. So maybe let's see that. So. I mean, I think the reflection is basically, there's not really that much. So in it, we added a file by running PyTest from the command line 
on it, we could see that a test passed and changing something, then the test failed. But the interesting thing about PyTest is it doesn't just say that something went wrong, but can inspect a little bit. And it even says, this is the line that ran. And this is what the actual results were. So somehow add was returning two plus three equals negative one, which made me think that it was changed to be two minus three. And um, with this, well, you know, as you try it out, you'll see more and more things like this. Um, let's, yeah, let's go on then. I think this explains it well enough for the optional exercise. So next up is automated testing. So now we take a lot like what we have just done, and we will do it on GitHub in an example. So Thomas is here to guide us through this because. The, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's en essentially um, what we've done until now is we have tested things locally. And um, for any larger projects that you have, it's quite important that uh, the tests are actually run before stuff is is added to your uh, repository because it can have effect uh, on other people that are using the code in your repository. And GitHub Actions allows us to do this. Um, so in this exercise, we will uh, create a copy of an existing um, it's a small repository and then set up a GitHub action that automatically runs tests um, once things are pushed to the main branch or once pull requests are, create, are being created. And that also gives us some information about um, how much uh, of the code actually was tested. Yeah. So, okay. Should we try it? Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, we, we will go through the initial setup of this uh, and let you do then the, um, yeah the writing additional tests, making modifications to the repository and so yeah. on. So we do steps one to three together, and then we go to the exercise time and you work more and we do, well, yeah. And then you can continue with that and do the rest of the steps. So we'll so, go quickly here, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Uh, act, actually, okay. uh, what, one thing that I need to um, correct myself or correct the exercise um, at the moment, uh, because we just noticed a mistake that we did. Mm -hmm. um, in the exercise, it says either create a new okay. repository or fork from the example repository. Um, the example repository is uh, now a template and not for yeah. not uh, directly. Well, you can fork it, but you can use that template to create a new repository, which you should do because otherwise your pull requests will end up on that repository, which is not okay. what this exercise is intending yeah. to do. So if so, you scroll down a little bit, Richard, mm -hmm. you, ha you, have a, you have a second part of the fork and uh, clone existing repository. Are we using yeah. this example one? Yes, we are using this example one. Okay. And so... if you... Uh, we'll click on this. the Python in okay. there. Mm -hmm. I clicked on Python. Then um, you should have a use this uh, repository. Um, so it's actually, I need to out of screen. It's a bit out of out of the size of your screen, I think. Fortunately, I need to sign in. Ah. I will. So use this template. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. And create in the repository. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I will call it PyTest example. Is that what it recommended? Uh, and public and I create it from the template. Okay. So 
yes, you can just watch now. You can also try to do it, but you will have time to do it later. This is just the preparation so, demo. Yeah, and the next step is then to clone this repository. Okay, so that's under oh. code. Actually, you, you don't even need that. You need to do this yet. Mm -hmm. um, this can be done later after we've actually enabled the tests. Oh. Um, it, it, de it depends on whether you want to run the tests beforehand locally well, or whether you... Let's enable the tests. So how so do we I are do that? What, what we're doing is we are essentially uh, skipping step two for now because um, we can't run it. Uh, we can't run PyTest at the moment because we haven't cloned it. But we are going directly to step three and enable the automatic testing. Um, you have an you have an actions field uh, above the or in in between the title of the mm -hmm. repository and the um, repository yeah. code. Yeah, exactly there. So and if you click, click on that, um, you will get some information about put possible uh, mm -hmm. uh, actions that GitHub suggests. Yeah, and actually the Python application action is roughly what we want. So. I click configure. Yeah, you okay. click on that. You click configure there. That will create that act. Will create that action, mm -hmm. um, or use that action as a template for you to yeah. to then modify. Okay. And um, in here, uh, we need to do a few things. And I think um, that was on the page, right? That is on the page. Yes. Okay. So there, I click configure. So and, here in yellow, it shows what it is. So I tell it pull request need to be right. Um, the reason for this is because um, we want to we want to be able to uh, allow an action to um, write a in a information into pull requests, which is the co uh, which is the code coverage. And uh, to be able to do that, it needs those permission uh, the permissions to write into the um, into the into the pull request. Yeah. So notice here, I'm making it aligned. This is yep. very important, or yes. stuff will go crazy. And let's see what else was yellow. So I need um, to install this part. Uh, so me... yeah, an extra um, pip you need, you need an additional line. you need additional packages for um. Um, that uh, are installed, and that is PyTest, PyTest Cuff, and Flag8. Uh, Flag8 mm -hmm. is a package, um, I, if I'm not entirely mistaken, yeah. it's essentially necessary for the linting uh, step that yeah. is in here, but that's already in there. Yeah. So this... just PyTest and PyTest Cuff. Yeah, this looks a little bit different, but that's okay. So we're installing more packages. And then, um, if you go a little bit further down. OK. And now there is this extra part. Yeah. Well, one thing is we don't just want to run PyTest, but we want to run PyTest so that it creates a coverage report. Co okay. A coverage report essentially um, tells you what lines of your code have been visited in during the test so what mm -hmm. lines of you could have actually been executed yeah and can give you an overview of um what your codes actually do mm -hmm. or actually run and that can help you a lot in figuring out which parts yeah. of your code are actually tested yeah but and put that and again this is a watching thing right now so um this is what you'll do yourself next yep. so don't worry all these steps are in the instructions so i copied this and i add it to pytest mm -hmm. and the and next... then the next line i copy um, and then you essentially uh, copy the next job because the, the this or the next step this is a full uh, there's a whole step that creates this coverage report <laughs> into pull requests um, it only does that into pull requests because uh, it needs to write the report somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. It can't just write into a commit um, like that. Yeah. Uh, that's why this has an if clause that 
Okay. All, that it's all, that it's only executed during pull requests. Yeah. And that's why it needs a secret, the GitHub token secret, so that it is allowed to write into that pull yeah. request. So what have we done now? We've set up this GitHub Actions file like the lesson has said. Mm -hmm. And then we start commit. Yeah. OK, let's see. I will say add test and commit directly to the main branch. OK. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do we and see if actions are working? And now if you go to your uh, main uh, your main repository. Um, like clicking here? Yes, yeah. The main repository page. And what do I see? You see this yellow yellowish dot here, uh, mm -hmm. right next to the commit message, uh, commit information. That is uh, indicating that some actions are currently running. Oh, it just turned into a check mark. So that means that your um, action succeeded, so that there is no issue with that action. Can I click on it? Yes. It says if you click on it, um, you will be taken. Uh, to All some more information. Passed. If Just you click on the Python application slash build push. Yeah, I'll click the details here. Um, that's out of screen. Oh, oops. Yeah, so there's details. And it shows it then, ran. Um, yeah, then you will be taken to the actions. Uh, that's the other way how to get there. If you look at the top, um, now you're in the actions tab. Yeah. And you, then there is um, all the things being run, and there is the information that the create coverage wasn't run. Yeah. And that is because this was a direct push or direct commit to the main branch. OK. And not a um, pull request to the main branch. Yeah. But so if what you are... click on that, on that test with PyTest um, part mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the action. It looks a lot like what we did locally. Yes. OK, good. So and it uh, and one interesting thing is uh, it says this 100 mm percent. -hmm. That, that's essentially what the coverage um, will tell you. OK. OK, so, so this this is how you set it up. And mm -hmm. should we go um, back to the lesson? Yeah, and essentially we also did step four. So we verified that the tests have been run automatically. Okay. And now it's up to you to add additional tests um, yeah. that show problems. Um, either uh, you can then create pull, uh, create branches and uh, do pull requests to your main branch, mm -hmm. or you can push directly. If you push directly, yeah. um, it will show errors. Uh, it will show errors in the action. Yeah. If you create pull requests, it will uh, potentially give you that. Um, Cover, uh, code coverage report about how much of your code mm -hmm. has actually been tested. Yes. So now we go to the exercise, which is right here. Um, and we've done steps one to three already as a demo. And now you can work on that. Is that good? I think so. And so, so do do steps one to three as they were done in the demo and then continue the yep. steps four to nine. Yes. OK. Um, yes, so let's give how long? 20 minutes? I think so, yeah. I but... guess. OK. 20 minutes and we will be back. And your goal is to do what you can. If you can't make it work, that's OK. You can resume later. OK, uh, bye for now then. OK, welcome back from the automated testing uh, uh, exercises. I hope everybody got some glimpse about the setting up the workflows. 
And one thing about the exercises that I wanted to, or the previous session that I wanted to point out was that what the big picture is that what we are doing here in the automated testing is uh, that we are, we are doing the exactly the same thing as we are doing locally. So writing tests and running tests locally, but we are doing them in the cloud. And that's why uh, we have this, a lot of scripting going on here, because basically what the script is doing is that we need to, in the cloud, we need to uh, set up the environment so that we can then run the tests the same way we would run them locally. It's so like this here, all this Python install stuff is setting, installing whatever we have on our computer. Yeah, so we can see here that we are setting up an Ubuntu environment. Yeah. Okay. So during the exercise, I also did this and I can show what it looks like. So up here in my other tab, uh, no. Here. Oops. So this was my repository. And we see that right now the tests are not passing because of the red X. If I go to pool requests, I see, okay, here's my pool request. It says it fixes issue number one. If I click on it, I see, well, first off is this Python coverage stuff. And I didn't realize it was this easy. So I think I'm gonna start doing this for my stuff now. So it says current status, um, coverage threshold. It gives this nice little report. But importantly down here, it says that all the checks have passed. So for example, if I expand it, I see that the, um, the test should now work. So I can merge it. And if I go back to the main repository page by clicking on the name, we see it's running the test on the new version, but it will soon become green. And we also see that the issue has been closed. Uh, yes, now okay, there's no, no issue open issues. So I think you can trust that this would become green. So now in our little bit of time left, we're going to talk about test design sum. So, yeah, um, back to the workshop page. So how would you design the tests? In, in, in general, um, so that you make your tests robust so that they um, actually check the not for any for any slightly more complex function, not just te testing one thing, but testing a couple of different inputs, um, just to see okay, it does work with different uh, with different inputs, and it and it creates the stuff properly. Yeah. Um, so this we're doing as a quick discussion now. Yeah. Not uh, as an exercise. There, there is the mention of test-driven development. Um, personal. Uh, this is more an. I think more more used in industry uh, mm -hmm. than academia, um, where yes, you do yeah. test, uh, you do write your tests before you write your code, mm -hmm. and your your code is essentially done as soon as your tests are running. Yeah. Because, and the idea is that you know what you want to achieve, and mm -hmm. you write your code so that it achieves what you want to achieve. So what can we, which of these tests should we talk about here? I, I think uh, testing randomness is something that is yeah. um, quite important because they, there, is the, there is the problem that um, a lot of code nowadays yeah. uh, does use some random starting points, yeah. for example. Can, can we, let's, how about we go quickly comment on each of the ones here in order? So peer and in peer functions. So. The peer functions is our first example. 
pretty and straightforward function that only that has inputs and outputs and doesn't you know. modify any additional state. Ah, yes. So for a function, two strings and a number, this is also pretty clear. It has inputs and you check the output. Um, it gets About. interesting as soon as you have stuff that is not within the function. Yeah. So here's something it <coughs> um, reads a file and returns a number. How do you manage things like reading from outside files in tests? Um, commonly, you create some test data. Yeah. Some data that you just um, supply along with your tests. So resources that your tests can access. Yes. What about a function with an outside dependency? Um, you provide the dependency in your requirements this? and have uh, need to have it installed beforehand um, and potentially test whether the import yeah. actually works. Yeah. So in this case, it's, it's setting this other, uh, yeah, like it imports What's React? Uh, from React it import imports a value from yeah. a from package. Yeah. So maybe that your test needs to consider that or set it to something that's known or look at that. That is there. one option uh, that you actually set the value of the max temperature mm -hmm. um, in in the reactor package. So you oh. essentially overwrite that. Yeah. So okay. that would be called mocking yep. the value. Yeah. Okay. Test for a mutable class. How would we manage this? So here, when we call this go for a walk function, it's changing something and it's not returning it. Luckily, in Python, everything is an object, so you can uh, and you can access whatever is in there. So you yeah. can directly access the values in the in the class. Yeah. In so, other programming languages, it might not be so easy. Yeah. Where you can't access internal state, but then you need to have a well. Then you need some way to be able to uh, retrieve that value, either retrieve that value, or um, uh, see the effects of it. Yeah. in a different functionality. So like maybe you would make a new instance of the class, then run the method and then see what it is, for example. Yeah. We've already talked about test-driven development. So let's continue past here. Where's the randomness once? This is where it gets interesting. So how do you test for randomness? Well, the, commonly, most programming languages do uh, pseudo-randomization. Mm -hmm. And you can initiate the random number generators. And um, what is often done is uh, you initiate the random number generator that is being used in the function. Mm -hmm. And you then test uh, with a certain seed. You run it once, assuming that it produces correct results. Mm -hmm. And you take the return values. That is something that you can test. Okay. Or so you basically make it not random for for your in your specific call. Yes. Yeah. Um, Have you ever done statistical testing? Like you, well, in this case, you're rolling a die, and you have it do run the function a thousand times and see is the average value what you expect. Uh, no, I didn't because I wouldn't trust that to be yeah. sensible in the end. Yeah. So basically, in that case, you would co compute, for example, the average value, and then you would check if it's in some interval. But yeah. then that interval is kind of arbitrary, and mm -hmm. like Thomas said, I wouldn't either trust yeah. it. And that you like. You it's like the, if the you said you the, always have you always have the range, so yeah. it, it could be somewhere completely out of that uh, out of that average, and yeah. your function is still prop working properly. Yeah, it, it actually it actually should be out of that interval. 
regularly. It's the classic p-value thing, isn't it? So yep. there's yes. if you set it where it's the 5% boundary, then 5% of the times your test will randomly fail. And that's yep. not very great. So. OK. Um, yeah. What about end-to-end -end test? Well, this is this essentially is similar to what I was describing for the randomness um, as well. Yeah. If you have outputs and put in, um, inputs and outputs known and, and running the whole thing, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, so, so what's the summary here? For any kind of function there is, someone's figured out a way to test it, or write the function in a way it can't be tested, even if it's random. And that is a pretty significant thing. Um, so don't give up oh. whatever you have. Yeah. To me, automated testing helps me a lot in keeping my code safe mm -hmm. and keeping my code maintainable. Yeah. Um, so, so what's our conclusion here, if we go to the conclusions? So mm, should we have a quick round table about what it is? Uh, so Thomas. Well, to, to me, um, having, having tests, as I said, uh, make, uh, makes code, uh, code more maintainable. Having coverage, to me, helps me uh, being motivated to do proper testing because you have a number that you can get up. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just a motivation thing that helps. Um, yeah. Other than that, for me, it, it helps, it helps uh, preventing bugs. Yeah. 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 Especially in the beginning, uh, the writing tests can feel really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest that everybody just write, uh, start writing tests and using them because it will get easier and also some tests even if they are not perfect, is much, much, much better than no tests at all. Yeah. And okay, your tests can worst case be if you want to um, publish uh, if you want to publish a paper, uh, throwing your inputs into the function, getting your outputs, and testing for yeah, yeah. for equality. That is yeah. also a way of testing. Yeah. For me, I guess my what I've learned here. First off, I'll be using code coverage more that I've seen. I can do it without another service. Um, I will. Um, one thing I want to mention with the code coverage. Um, if you are interested in the, a lot of good repositories have this co coverage and a number uh, mm -hmm. badge and so on. Um, this is normally due to an uh, additional service like CodeCov or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you if you are interested in that, have a look at the have a look at their documentation. There is plenty yeah. of it. And yeah. And whenever I start, you know, I'll start small with the peer functions. So usually I'll start with testing just a small subset, but still that's better than nothing. And over time it expands as I realize it's more and more important. So with that said, it is time for a break again. And then we go to the final part which is modular code development. And like I've said before, this is a great example of things. OK, so um, yes, break time and see you at four past the hour. <laughs>